Hello, my name is Pete and I'm a PhD student at King's College London at the Centre for Stem Cells and Regenerative Medicine. And the title of my talk is Making Stem Cells Move, How to Build a Neuromuscular System in a Dish. And so the research I'm involved with is basically trying to understand how nerve cells connect to muscle and how this lets us precisely control the way that we move. And I thought to help illustrate this, I'd start by introducing you to possibly one of the world's most elite athletes. And that is, of course, Phil the Power Taylor, a professional darts player and 16 time uh, world champion. And in this slow motion uh, video of Phil's darts throw, you can see the precise motor control that he's mastered over his career. So currently his brain is sending thousands of electrical impulses traveling at hundreds of miles an hour down his spinal cord to all the different muscle groups in his legs, in his arms and in, in his fingers. And these electrical impulses have to cross uh, these special connections that form between the nerve cells and the muscle. And these connections are called neuromuscular junctions. And what they do is basically convert all the electrical uh, signals from his brain into precisely controlled muscle contractions. And that's how he's able to finally control the release of the dart and hit the 180. And so this is what those uh, connections look like. So you've got the nerve cells in green and then a tiny gap called a synapse uh, and then the muscle. And when an electrical impulse reaches the end of the nerve cell, it causes the nerve cell to release uh, these neurotransmitters, which then travel across the synapse and interact with receptors on the muscle to make it contract. And so our research is really interested in understanding how these specialised connections work. And in particular, we're also interested in understanding how these connections can go wrong in people with certain diseases. So in diseases like motor neuron disease, these connections begin to degenerate and quite rapidly a person will lose their motor function until they're left completely paralysed. And currently there's no way that we know how to treat these patients. And so what we want to do is basically build these neuromuscular connections in a dish. So the challenge we've set ourselves is to build an entire working neuromuscular system from scratch. That way we can study how it works and how it goes wrong. And to do this, we need a number of key parts. So we need the nerve cells and specifically we need a subtype of a nerve cell called motor neurons that control uh, movement. And then these motor neurons also need uh, special, special support cells called astrocytes and these help to keep them alive. Uh, and then finally we need the muscle. And so to get all these different cell types, we uh, actually use stem cells as a tool. So basically stem cells are a great tool for this because they have the ability to keep on growing and also the ability to become any other cell type in the body. So from one cell, we can grow all the different nerve cells and muscle cells that we want. Another great thing is that we now know how to make these stem cells from adult cells. So we can take a blood sample or a skin sample from patients with motor neuron disease and basically hit the reset button on these cells to convert them back into these very early stem cells. That way we have cells in the lab with the exact same genetic background as the patients with motor neuron disease. So we then take these stem cells and push them to become all the different cell types that we want. So we'll have a nerve cell cocktail that turns them, the stem cells into motor neurons and a muscle cell cocktail that turns them into muscle. And then what we do is basically combine all these cells together to make a fully working neuromuscular system in a dish. And so to help with this, we have these tiny little uh, microchips to control the spatial organization of the different parts. So it's a bit like a, a computer chip, but instead of being wired up with electronics, it's wired up with uh, nerve cells and muscle cells, and they sort of form this mini neuromuscular circuit. And in the chip, we have these different compartments. So we have a nerve cell compartment and a muscle compartment, and then these tiny little channels that allow the axons of the nerve cells to grow through and connect with the muscle. And so in green, you can see here the nerve cells growing through the, the channels and then into the muscle compartment. And then in the red, you can see the muscle. And then what we can do is actually image the neuromuscular connections themselves. So here's a 3D reconstruction of one of those, and you can see the nerve cell in green, uh, and then packages of neurotransmitter in red and then the neurotransmitter receptors in blue that are on the muscle. So then another challenge is how do we control the activity of this neuromuscular system? So normally a brain is controlling the uh, electrical impulses that are sent to the muscle. So how do we recreate this in a dish? And so we look to nature to see how it can be done. So there, there are these single, tiny little uh, single cell organisms called chlamydomonas um, that swim around and are, and are able to swim in response to, to light. And this is because they have this special protein, uh, a light receptor, similar to the ones that you have in your eye, and these get activated in response to light. And so what we've done is cloned the gene that makes this protein uh, into our stem cells. So when we push the stem cells to become motor neurons, they will fire an impulse when we shine light onto them. And because the neurons are now formed these connections with the muscle, when we activate the neurons with the light, the muscle will then contract. And so hopefully you can see this in this video here, that this is what one of those contractions looks like. And you can see we can track the movement of the muscle using these velocity vectors. And so then we want to try and use the system to understand more about motor neuron disease. 
So when we build a system uh, using stem cells taken from patients with motor neuron disease, we find that after a while, the neuromuscular connections begin to fail and the muscle contractions get weaker. So this is really similar to what you'd see in actual patients with the disease. And you can see here in the top panel that you've got a heat map of the muscle contraction for a healthy neuromuscular circuit. And then in the bottom one, you can see that the contractions are much weaker in the circuits made from cells taken from patients with motor neuron disease. And interestingly, what we found is that the cells that support the motor neurons, so these are the astrocytes, are partly responsible for this effect. So instead of creating a supportive environment for the nerve cells, they actually start to have a toxic effect. And this impacts how the nerve cells are able to connect to the muscle. And so then we've been looking at different ways in which we can correct the system to try and find possible treatments for motor neuron disease. And the first thing we've looked at is possible drug targets. And one that we're particularly interested in is part of a molecular pathway that controls degeneration of nerve cells. And we find that if we block this pathway using a drug called necrostatin, um, we're able to restore the neuromuscular connections and the muscle contractions in the, in the system. So at the top, you can see the weak muscle contractions in the neuromuscular circuits made from uh, cells taken from patients with motor neuron disease. And then in the bottom, you can see that these same cultures treated with this drug have a massively increased uh, contraction. Uh, and there are now actually a few clinical trials that have started testing whether this target could potentially be used in patients with motor neuron disease. And another approach we're taking to try and correct the problems we see uh, is to use gene editing technologies. So imagine if you were to write out the entire human genome, like a massive instruction manual for making a human, it would be about three billion uh, letters long. Uh, and actually at the Wellcome Collection in London, you can actually go and, go and look at this. So they've actually printed this out uh, and it sits in this massive bookshelf. So every cell in your body contains all of this information. And actually in some cases of motor neuron disease, we know that a single change to one of these letters is enough to cause the disease. And so what we've done in the lab is to use this really new gene editing technology called CRISPR. Uh, so it acts like a pair of molecular scissors uh, to go in and cut out the wrong letter and then put the correct one in. And so we're currently in the process of figuring out why uh, these, such a small change in the DNA uh, has such a strong effect on uh, the neuromuscular connections in patients with, uh, with motor neuron disease. And so that's really the future goal of this research is to, is to understand exactly how these diseases work and then translate that into improved clinical outcomes. Um, so thank you for listening to this lightning lecture. Um, next time you're playing sports or in the pub throwing darts, just remember how many uh, neuromuscular connections are being activated to let you do that. Hi everyone. My name is Christina and I am a skin scientist. Today I'd like to speak to you about something that may seem a bit boring at first, something that we all either have or will develop at some point in our lives. Um, what am I talking about? Scars. Now, you know, we might have been crazy kids at some point, thinking we're Superman, flying off tables and cutting open our knees um, and not thinking twice about it. Our skin heals. It forms the scar and you know 20 years later you see that and you remember that that was that crazy thing that you did um, it doesn't really affect you very much and you have fond memories of that time however for others it can be quite debilitating it could be a scar that's formed from a traumatic event such as a house fire or a surgery that they had to undergo to save their lives and when they see that scar it reminds them about that time scars can also develop over different body parts, uh, they can be of different sizes, and if a scar forms over something like a, a joint, for example, you could lose movement in that joint. It can be really painful, it can be really itchy and very disfiguring. And so for people that really have quite a severe scar, this is something that really affects their mental health and their quality of life. And we um, as scientists are trying to develop a way to improve their scarring and to improve their quality of life. So our skin is an incredible organ. I've got an example here to, to illustrate that. It's made up of three main layers and I like to think about it like a bed. We've got the top layer, the small section on the top known as the epidermis. And that's kind of like the duvet on our, on our bed. Its job is to seal the skin, form a barrier to prevent bugs and bacteria from coming in and protecting us. It also keeps our moisture inside and keeps all our organs in our body. The next layer is this middle section here. You can see it's the bulk of the skin. It's known as the dermis. 
Um, this is the mattress of the bed. Essentially, it's the structural components. It's where your springs are, essentially. And um, it's really important for a lot of functions of the skin. And the final layer is this little bottom layer here, this yellow layer here called the, the hypodermis. And that's the fat layer. So think about that kind of like the base of the bed where everything sits on top. And that just helps keep um, our body temperature regular and helps with some immune-based um, signaling. So how does a scar form? Well, when we wound ourselves, and we have this massive gash into the skin, there's a whole cascade of events that take place, and it's quite, it's fascinating. There's, it's kind of a well-synchronized orchestra, and it happens in stages. The first thing is, you've, you've, met, you've cut some blood vessels in the process of having that that's wound, and so blood gushes into that, into the hole, um, releasing immune cells in, into the area. These immune cells are responsible for eating up any bacteria that now has entered because the barrier has been broken. But they also send signals, like alert signals, to the other cells in the skin to say, we have an emergency here, something is, something is happening, come fix it. So the blood will solidify and make a clot, um, and that's why you get a scab. But the signals that the immune cells are sending will tell the, the keratinocytes, so those are the, those cells in the top layer of the epidermis, tells them to start replicating a lot so they can start closing that hole. And that's the top layer. So that's the first thing that happens, that hole closes. But underneath, you've still got a big hole there. And so the immune cells, the signals that they sent, tell the cells in the dermis, the main cells are called the fibroblasts. And they are responsible for producing proteins that, um, that provide the structure of the skin. So you may have heard of a protein called collagen. That's the main protein that we, we essentially have in, that, in, the, in the dermis. There are other proteins that, such as elastin or fibronectin. But essentially, these cells will get the alert signal, migrate to the wound, and start to replicate themselves as well and produce all these proteins to try and fill the hole. So think about a pothole in the road, for example. These cells, their job is to just fill, this, you know, fill the hole with the cement. The cement are these proteins. Now, because it's an emergency state, we've got a hole, it needs to be fixed. There's no time to make all the other things that the skin has. You know, we've got beautiful hair follicles in the skin. We've got sweat glands. We've got nerve cells. These things will take time to regenerate. And so it's an emergency state. We just say, fill the, fill the cement, close the hole. And that's why scars look so different to normal skin because it's a repair job rather than a regenerative job. So my research is looking to try and push the skin to become more regenerative. And how are we going to do this? Well, we've discovered in our lab that the fibroblasts in the dermis aren't all the same. There are different populations, really specific populations that have different functions. And most of the time, these are found based on where these cells are located within the dermis. So the cells that are at the top, they, they're known as the papillary fibroblasts. They are responsible for your, your more elastic uh, fibers, the, the softer tissue, kind of your, your, baby, your baby soft skin. The, the, however, the cells from the bottom part of the, of the dermis, they make more thick collagen fibers um, and are responsible for the kind of that first wave of, of wound healing where it's really that really thick cement. So if you have a scar that has a lot of, of extracellular matrix, so it's really overgrown, this, this type of scar is called a hypertrophic scar, we would like to develop a cell therapy where we take a biopsy of your skin, we separate the different populations of fibroblasts and grow them in the lab, we can inject the papillary fibroblasts that are much more elastic to go into the, that scar tissue and remodel it and break it down and make it more supple and more elastic and hopefully make it look a little bit more like normal skin. And with that idea, it's a unique um, bespoke treatment specific to your scar to help it become more flexible, um, to ta hopefully take away any pain or discomfort and, and smooth out and try and make the skin look a little bit normal um, and, and regenerated. I hope you've enjoyed this lightning lecture. Next time you cut yourself, remember how incredible your skin is and think about all those cells that are communicating with each other to heal that wound. We hope that our research will contribute to improving the quality of life for patients with severe scarring.